Tonight, Hamas hunted. Israel claims a successful assassination of a key Hamas leader, with Ramadan posing no means of a pause to the warfare. Territory trouble. China and India see tense relations over contested borders, with diplomacy seeing a strain. Is it Arunachal or Tibet? Chaos in Haiti. Gang leaders in the conflict-ridden nation force the Prime Minister Ariel Henry out of his seat, law and order dissolving into mayhem for innocent civilians. And a helping hand. A first of its kind transplant gives hope to an artist in a way that no one thought possible. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Hello and welcome to World News Tonight. Thanks very much for tuning in and we hope you've had a terrific Tuesday so far. And we hope you're ready to receive your nightly roundup of key global stories from us over here at World News. Let's get right to it. Kicking off with the Israel-Palestine conflict. Israel has said that it was checking whether Hamas's deputy military leader had actually been killed in an airstrike in Gaza, which was launched based on intelligence about its location, as prospects faded for a ceasefire to coincide with the Muslim month of Ramadan. Marwan Issa would be the highest-ranking Hamas official killed by Israel in five months of war that have pulverized the Gaza Strip and killed thousands of Palestinians. Nicknamed the Shadow Man for his ability to stay off Israel's radar, He's one of three top Hamas leaders who planned the October 7th attack and are believed to still be directing military operations. Israeli army radios said the Anusayrat camp in central Gaza had been bombed on Saturday night, following intelligence about Issa's location, and five people were killed. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz reported that Israel was checking if the fatalities included Issa. Neither the Israeli military nor Hamas officials immediately commented on the media reports. As Ramadan began on Monday, countries including the US and Egypt stepped up airdrops of aid, and United Nations Chief Antonio Guterres said international humanitarian law lay in tatters. My strongest appeal today is to honour the spirit of Ramadan by silencing the guns and removing all obstacles to ensure the delivery of life-saving aid at the speed and massive scale required. At the same time, and in the Ramadan spirit of compassion, I call for the immediate release of all hostages. Guterres warned Israel's threatened assault on Rafah could plunge the people of Gaza into, quote, an even deeper circle of hell. In Rafah, displaced Palestinian Fada Hamed said the first day of Ramadan was tough. She didn't have gas to cook on and food was too expensive. If the first day of Ramadan has been tough on us, how will the second and third days be? We are calling for a ceasefire, not a humanitarian truce or anything else. We want to go back to our homes. We want to live the spirit of Ramadan like every year. We want to decorate and feel the joy of Ramadan. The children's happiness has faded away. They are used to Ramadan decorations on the streets and in homes and looking forward to Ramadan. Gaza's health ministry says at least 31,000 Palestinians have been killed since the war broke out. That followed the October 7th attack, when Hamas militants killed 1,200 people, according to Israeli tallies. The United Nations estimates about a quarter of the Strip's population risks starvation, and the trickle of aid is barely scratching the surface of daily needs. China has said it has launched a diplomatic protest with India over Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to the region of Arunachal Pradesh, reiterating its claim over the area by saying India's claims will only complicate the unresolved boundary questions. PM Modi dedicated to the nation the Sela Tunnel built at an altitude of 13,000 in Arunachal Pradesh. China, which claims Arunachal as the South Tibet, routinely objects the Indian leader's visits to the state highlighting its claims. Beijing has also named the area Sangna. India has repeatedly rejected China's territorial claims over Arunachal Pradesh, asserting that the state is an integral part of the country. New Delhi has also dismissed Beijing's move to assign invented names to the area, saying it did not alter the reality. China's foreign ministry spokesperson said Sangnan area is China's territory. 
He also added that the Chinese government has never recognized that so-called Arunachal Pradesh illegally set up by India and firmly opposes it. India has no right to arbitrarily develop the area in Sangnan in China. India's relevant moves will only complicate the boundary question and disrupt the situation in the border areas between the two countries, he said. China strongly deplores and firmly opposes the India leader's visit to the east section of China-India boundary. Haiti's unelected Prime Minister Ariel Henry will step down once his transition council and temporary replacement have been appointed after leading the Caribbean country since the 2021 assassination of its last president. Armed gangs massively grew their wealth, influence and territory under his administration, prompting Henri to travel to Kenya in late February to secure its support for a United Nations-backed security mission to help police. Haiti's Prime Minister Ariel Henry has announced he will resign following weeks of international pressure. He made the announcement hours after officials from the Caribbean and the U.S. met to discuss a solution to Haiti's crisis. Thank you for uh, your leadership today, but thank you for your leadership every day. Law and order in Haiti has collapsed in recent weeks as gangs have attacked the main airport and burned down police stations. Henry is currently stranded in Puerto Rico after being prevented by armed gangs from returning home. Well, over in Japan now, as revised government data has showed Japan's economy avoided a technical recession, even though the upward change in the fourth quarter was weaker than expected and highlighted concerns about the sluggish economic recovery. For more on this situation, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Rasita Chandra Dasa from Tokyo in Japan. What's your analysis, Rasita? Hi, I'm Rasita. Japan announced its revised growth stats yesterday. So the previously announced growth of minus 0 0.4 became uh, plus 0 0.4 after this uh, adjustment. And this technically avoided that so-called technical recession. So this news came yesterday, and it's very interesting that how the market reacted. After aging past 40,000 yen to a historical highs last week, the market kind of crashed. The Japanese stock sharply fell yesterday, and it actually go, go, uh, went down uh, around 38,000, 39,000, it was a 2% drop. And people were asking, like, wondering why this has happened, because if the growth is fine, if the economy is sound, why the stock is going down? And the reason for that is exactly the same reason as the growth, because the BOG, the speculations of the BOG's monetary policy, especially on its uh, interest rate, which is kept in the negative zone now. If the GDP is fine, the, the economists and the analysts might think that the BOG would, G, BOG would uh, indicate that they are willing to go beyond these zero negative interest rate policies and increase the interest rate after many years. So this is uh, this skeptic made the market crashes yesterday, and even today it slightly went down, and uh, and the enthusiasm they had last week has uh, cooled cooled down a little bit. So with the BLG's monetary policy in question, and the economy is growing slightly, uh, the next government moves are keenly watched by the investors around the world. Over to you, Anwar. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Rasita Chandradasa from Tokyo in Japan. Thanks again. And on the road to the White House tonight, Trump might have a harder time than expected in persuading the female population to have faith in him over the course of this election season. According to new polls, female support for former President Donald Trump has dropped by 5%. This new polling comes amid new fallout in his civil sexual assault and defamation case against E. Jean Carroll. Despite the former president's recent success in the polls against Joe Biden, his numbers with women continue to struggle. A Quinnipiac survey found Trump's support among female registered voters has dropped 5% since December to just 36 points, trailing President Biden among women by double digits. 
reproductive rights, including IVF and abortion, putting Trump and Republicans on defense in the 2024 race in the wake of that controversial Alabama Supreme Court ruling that endangered IVF procedures. Trump quickly clarifying he supports the treatment. I strongly support the availability of IVF for couples who are trying to have a precious little beautiful baby. I support it. But abortion still looming large over the campaign. In his State of the Union address, President Biden predicting the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade will bring Democrats a win in November. It's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following. And with all due respect, justices, women are not without electoral electoral power. Uh, Excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right about the issue remaining a top liability for Trump in the general. In a new ABC News IPSIS poll out this weekend, Trump leads Biden on almost all the major issues. But on abortion, Biden takes a lead by 12 points. Now former RNC chair Ronna McDaniel delivering this message to party activists on Friday before stepping down from her post. We cannot put our head in the sands and ignore abortion and the Dobbs decision. Let's go in for a short commercial break now. On the other side, we have updates on South Korea's doctor strikes and Russia's elections. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's take you to Asia now. In the face of an escalating medical crisis, the South Korean government has taken steps to fill the void left by absent trainee doctors. It's also bracing for further disruptions as medical professors have expressed their intention to join in with the collective action of their own. With South Korea now in the fourth week of a mass walkout by trainee doctors, the government is scrambling to mitigate the resulting medical staff shortages. On Monday, the Ministry of Health and Welfare deployed a total of 158 personnel, including 20 military doctors and 138 doctors from public health centers to 20 general hospitals for four weeks. These military doctors will start working from Wednesday after completing training. The health ministry also plans to deploy around 200 more public health doctors by next week. As of Monday, the government sent advance notices of license suspensions to over 5,500 trainee doctors who have not returned to their posts despite a return to work order. Despite these measures, the situation may escalate as medical professors plan to join the protest. The Medical Professors Association of Korea is set to convene on Thursday to discuss the mass boycott of classes by medical students and the ongoing issue of absentee trainee doctors. The discussion will likely focus on repercussions for the students, including the possibility of giving students a failing grade for the semester, as well as the medical faculty's potential unified response. Separately, five leading hospitals in Seoul are also setting up meetings to examine the possibility of joint action and perhaps other issues, signaling a broader wave of protests within the healthcare community. In fact, all medical professors at Seoul National University announced on Monday their intention to resign a mess next Monday unless the government addresses the mess walkout by trainee doctors. Health Minister Cho Gyu Hong in a briefing on Tuesday expressed deep concern over the decision, saying it would put patients at risk. We express grave concerns over the collective decision by medical professors at Seoul National University because it threatens the lives and health of patients. Meanwhile, the government on Tuesday launched a reporting center within the Ministry of Health and Welfare. This aims to ensure a safe return to work for trainee doctors who may fear being publicly identified and subjected to group harassment. The government stressed its commitment to firmly addressing any threats of retaliation against those doctors. Well, over in Russia now, the nation is poised to hold its presidential elections, which President Vladimir Putin is almost certain to win. It will give the longest-serving Kremlin chief since Yosef Stalin another six-year term in power. Russia's elections are set to take place between the 15th and 17th of March, and results will follow shortly afterwards. And the winner will be inaugurated in May. So how exactly will this process work? Well, to tell you a little bit about this, we have other than the world news special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli. Yes, I'm ready. 
There are 112.3 million people with the right to vote in the election. Almost 2 million people abroad can also participate and 12,000 in a cosmodrome which Russia rents in Kazakhstan. Around 70 to 80 million people usually cast ballots. Turnout in 2018 was 67.5%. This year, a remote online voting system will also be available for the first time. Putin is running against communist Nikola Karitono Leonid Slatsky, leader of the Nationalist Liberal Democratic Party and Vladislav Davankov of the New People Party. It was originally specified that a president could only serve two terms of four years if they were back to back. But amendments in 2008 extended the presidential term to six years. And changes in 2020 formally reset Putin's old presidential term tally to zero from 2024, potentially allowing him to remain in power until 2036. Opinion polls here show Putin has approval ratings of 85% higher than before the invasion of Ukraine. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much for the continued updates. That was other than the world news special correspondent, Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. And now on Russia's unlikely allies. A U.S. intel agency says it's pretty sure that North Korea has no intention of engaging in nuclear negotiations and is trying to have its status as a nuclear state recognized through its close military ties with Russia. Each year, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence releases its threat assessment report, analyzing the different threats the U.S. faces from other countries. In its latest edition of the report, released on Monday, it analyzed the current situation with North Korea, indicating that the regime's leader has no intention of engaging in nuclear negotiations and is trying to achieve its status as a nuclear state recognized through close military ties with Russia. The report said that Kim Jong-un has no intention of negotiating to dismantle the nuclear program as he considers nuclear weapons as a tool to guarantee the regime's security and a source of national pride. It further said that Kim will continue to pursue nuclear and conventional military capabilities that threaten the United States and its allies. Taking note of President Yoon sung yeols hardline stance against North Korea, the report said North Korea has shown a higher frequency of missile provocations since the strengthening of trilateral military cooperation with Seoul, Washington and Tokyo. The annual report stressed that the Kim regime will prioritize building a more powerful missile system, ranging from cruise missiles to intercontinental ballistic missiles and hypersonic missiles, while China and Russia help with supplying materials and technology needed to achieve that goal. The report also assessed threats posed by China and Russia. In regards to Beijing, it said that its economic rival has the ability to compete directly with the United States and its allies and threaten rules-based international order. It added that serious demographic and economic challenges facing China could transform it into a more aggressive and unpredictable actor. On the other hand, it said Russia is strengthening its relations with North Korea, China and Iran, but does not want a direct military conflict with the United States and NATO. Still, it says that Russia remains a threat to a rules-based society, as shown by its invasion of Ukraine. And over in the UK, Britain's King Charles hailed the work of the Commonwealth on its 75th anniversary. Queen Camilla led senior royals at London's Westminster Abbey, where they gathered for a service marking the day. The British monarch, who is currently recuperating from cancer treatment, paid tribute to the voluntary club via a pre-recorded video message, saying that he would continue to serve to the best of his ability. Charles was not the only senior royal absent. Kate, wife of his elder son and heir, Prince William, did not attend as she continues her recovery from abdominal surgery. For most of its existence, the Commonwealth, one of the world's biggest international organizations covering 2.5 billion people, was led by Charles's late mother, Queen Elizabeth, who was instrumental in its creation and regarded it as one of her proudest achievements.
More trouble at Boeing tonight. At least 50 people were hurt when a Boeing 787 dropped abruptly mid-flight from Sydney to Auckland. The aircraft experienced a strong shake and as a result, 10 passengers and three cabin crew members were taken to a hospital. Investigations are still underway on what exactly caused the incident. Video from inside Chilean flight Latsum 800 capturing the aftermath of some harrowing moments. On board the flight from Sydney to Auckland, New Zealand, 50 injured passengers and crew members, at least one lying on the floor, others with bleeding head injuries after being thrown to the ceiling. 13 sent to area hospitals. In a statement, the airline says the plane experienced a strong shake during flight, the cause of which is currently under investigation. On Flight Aware, Lantum 800 is shown flying at 41,000 feet when its altitude reading is suddenly lost for roughly an hour and 10 minutes, then reappearing as the plane approaches Auckland. The Boeing 787 was supposed to fly on to Santiago after stopping in Auckland. Meanwhile, the Justice Department has launched a new criminal investigation into Boeing, following the blowout of the door plug on a 737 MAX 9 in January. The NTSB has determined the plane left the Boeing plant without four critical bolts that hold the plug in place. Among the questions, does Boeing's admitted quality control breakdown violate a previous agreement with justice after two fatal Boeing MAX 8 crashes killed 346 people? A scathing FAA audit found Boeing failed to comply with its own quality control procedures. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, over the years, we have seen medical technologies evolve at breakneck speeds, especially the process of transplantation that went from kidneys and hearts to the most delicate corneas and skin and hair, and even faces lately. Well, tonight, we see a surgery that is a first of its kind, a double hand transplant. And this special surgery has handed hope to a once desolate artist, courtesy of a kind soul. It was the first surgery of its kind in New Delhi, and doctors say it was a success. A rare double hand transplant was carried out, and the patient is reportedly doing very well since the procedure in January. A woman who pledged to donate her organs was declared brain dead. The man who received her hands is a painter, and he was kept ready for the surgery. When the woman's family decided to take her off life support, they also carried out her final wish to donate her body parts to people who need them. She used to inspire us about the importance of donating organs. She informed us that she is ready to donate her organs if she dies. So we remembered her wish and gave consent for the transplant. The patient is reportedly still recovering, but he has a good outlook thanks to a generous donor who gave this painter some important tools. And finally tonight, another heartwarming story that was born of warm and cozy handicrafts. In a tiny Athens apartment, a 93-year-old grandmother, Ioana Masoka, has crocheted thousands of brightly colored scarves for children in need, from Ukraine to Greece. She says she will keep crocheting for kids everywhere until she just can't any longer. Since she took up crocheting in the 1990s, Matsoka is estimated to have easily made over 3,000 scarves. These scarves have been sent to children in Ukraine, Bosnia, and to migrant camps and shelters in Greece. Children in Greece and abroad who received her scarves have sent her letters and drawings in thanks. She crochets one scarf a day, now with small imperfections, as her vision is impaired with age. Nonetheless, she continues to pour her love into her handicraft. Well, the story itself makes you feel really warm and fuzzy inside, even if we aren't wearing any scarves right now. The power of love and handicrafts. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the key happenings across the globe. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.